Welcome to another episode of Think Mighty, a video series and podcast for active lifestyle and outdoor brands, where we interview marketers, founders, and entrepreneurs on their growth strategies. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube or follow along wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Let's get into the episode. Hey, Kyle, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jared. I appreciate it. How, uh, how, how's your traveling been going? Uh, intense. Uh, my travel schedule continues to ramp up more and more just when I think that, okay, that that's it. I, I can't travel more and here I am traveling again. So yeah, I just got <laughs> back, from, uh, back from business mastery in Amsterdam Tuesday night. Awesome. Well, glad to have you back in the States. So for all of our listeners, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Um, I'm Kyle Zbrodsky. I'm the founder and CEO of Osteo Strong. We are a, we are a wellness brand, um, really kind of falling into an industry that's being created, biohacking industry, which I think probably most of the people listening to this know what biohacking is, but it's really a concept that tries to find the most efficient ways to leverage maximum health. Um, and there's been so much innovation in this area and people have learning so much in the past few years. OsteoStrong falls within that category. And within that category, OsteoStrong specializes in what we call skeletal strength conditioning. Um, and that, that's what it is that we're doing. And so what was your background? What did you do before OsteoStrong? Uh, a lot of things. I've, I've been a serial entrepreneur since I was really a teenager. Um, but I guess the, there's two things that I, I did that really led to my role at where, what I'm doing now. And uh, just before this, I started a software company in 1997 uh, that was designed to be an operations uh, billing membership management software platform for the fitness industry. Um, and we ended up serving several gyms around the world. We were in like 60 countries. Um, and we did all the design development support of that before that. And really the impetus for that was, uh, I was a franchisee with, uh, curves, uh, curves for women franchises in the late nineties, early two thousands. And those were the two main things. There's other stuff I've done, but they don't really pertain to, to where I am today. <laughs> That's awesome. So how did, how did you find out what, what sort of started your path down Osteo Strong? So um, it's interesting because I'd started with uh, my wife and I started opening up Curves franchises in the 90s. Uh, we, we always had a, a passion for health and helping other people. And I think that's a common thread that many people have that running through them. You want to help other people and, and fitness is a, is a route to do that. I started a software company out of need that we were facing with our franchises. Curves International ended up endorsing and using our software during that time. Um, it's kind of funny. I don't have a software background. I didn't do software development. It wasn't really a passion of mine. It was uh, more of a need that I saw that needed to be filled. And I didn't even really start that company with the intent of starting a company. It was an idea and I started working on it and it just sort of happened. Um, technology was, was never really a passion of mine. Um, I learned how to run a software company and do all that stuff and uh, support and everything but it wasn't really my passion or desire. I looked at it as a utility that was there to support people in their success, but I was always wanting to be more on the front end trying to help people. And so as, as successful as that company has been, it wasn't really scratching my entrepreneurial itch and kind of who I am in, in my heart. And so I was looking for something, something else to do that can get me back on the front lines of, of serving people more directly and not so indirectly. I stumbled across, uh, it was really serendipitous. I stumbled across Dr. Jayquish and I was actually thinking about starting a fitness chain, but there, there's, you know, fitness is a very well served industry around the world, but especially in the United States, uh, there, there were, there are like 35,000 gyms in the United States. And so as much as I wanted to be back into that world, um, I just thought, you know, God, do I, what, what, am I, what am I going to do? Am I just going to go in here and be another type of gym? It's not really serving the way that I want to serve. And then I, and I ran a Dr. J question. He's the guy that invented the original prototype that I based the franchise on of what it is that we do. And when I saw his technology, I, I, I experienced two emotions. It was love and fear at the same time. Um, I was absolutely enthralled with what it did and I loved it, but I had this fear too, because it was very unusual in the way that it worked. It required a lot of un, uh, education to get you to understand what in the world it was. And I thought this thing is going to end up in the dustbin of history unless somebody goes out there 
and creates a brand and a concept around it. And so I was like, oh, do I really, I don't know, I really want to do this. I mean, I did, but I just knew how hard it was going to be. And so I went home and I told my wife uh, after I had that meeting with Dr. Jake, she saw what he was doing. I said, this is what I think I'm supposed to be doing. I said, what do you think? Are you going to support me in this? And she says, I'll, I'll support you anything you do, but I can tell <laughs> by the look in your face, you've already made up your mind and you're going to do it. You're going to do it anyway. So she says, I'll support you whatever you want to do. So that was kind of how the uh, concept and the idea started. And so what was it about the, the idea that really drew you to it? What was the potential you saw? So the way the technology works, so we, do skeletal strength conditioning. That's what the system was originally, you know, the design and the heart behind it. But there are many other physical benefits you get out of what is it we do from radical increases in strength, balance, agility, improvements in posture, reduction or elimination of joint and back pain. We see members reversing osteoporosis. We see members reversing type 2 diabetes. For me, in my own personal story, I had suffered from decades of chronic joint and back pain from sports-related injuries in my teens and early 20s, and um, it was really bad. I had bad knees, a bad hip. I had a bad lower back, bad mid-back, bad upper back, bad neck, my right shoulder, my right elbow. I couldn't lift my arm laterally with more than like eight or nine pounds more without hurting my, without hurting my uh, uh, shoulder. And you know, if you've got chronic pain and you just manage it, you end up making decisions differently. You start abbreviating activities that you just won't do because it's going to lead to more pain. I used to get migraine headaches all the time. And so after just a few sessions at Osteo Strong, my joint back pain was virtually gone. And it kind of surprised me. Pain is, they, they say pain has a bad memory. Um, and I actually forgot that I was in pain. And it wasn't really until I was on like a five or six hour flight and the flight was coming in for a landing and the, the flight attendant said, move your seat back forward. And my back, I didn't even, I didn't even recline it, which is usually um, I get like, would get claustrophobic on a plane because my back would start tightening up and I'd be like, Oh my God, here it comes. And I'd be taking Advil and uh, all this kind of stuff. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I was just on a plane for like five hours. And I didn't, and I forgot to recline my seat. Uh, and that wasn't me. Um, so that, that was kind of my story. What we see with other people is uh, we see athletes blowing through their personal performance records and speed and strength and these kind of things in just a couple sessions. It's, it's amazing. Um, we see these same kind of ridiculous performance increases in the elderly. So we have people in their 70s, 80s, 90s years old ambling along with a walker or a cane. They just don't need them after a couple of months. Um, it's, uh, it's truly it's truly amazing the way that works and the sessions. I mean, they, they, they only require about 60 seconds of actual effort one day per week of a members there for about 10 or 15 minutes, but you don't break a sweat. You don't get fatigued. You don't get sore the next day. And so the, the foundation like was there. I saw this technology is going to utterly change uh, so many lives, so many millions of lives. And um, it was, uh, it was, you know, it was a have to. And when I, when I finally started like seeing what it was doing for me and other people, I'm like, man, I've, I've got to do this thing. I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm, if I'm totally up for the challenge. I hadn't started a franchise before. In fact, I didn't even really want to start a franchise in the beginning. I just wanted to create a concept and license it out. That franchising law is really crazy. Um, and I had to do the franchise. So that's, uh, that's the direction we ended up going. So I'm like, okay, you know, when I started my software company, I didn't know anything about running a software company. I didn't know how to write a line of code. Um, when I started Osteo Strong, I didn't know a whole lot about franchising either. So I'm like, okay, well, I figured out software. I'll figure this out too. So, so you found this really, really unique concept. You had the technology. You had a vision for what it could be. What were sort of the, the first steps? What did you do first to, to launch this thing and, and you know, put it out in the market? You know, it's, uh, it's, Osteo Strong is, a, is an interesting uh, case study. And I think it's something that I'll probably end up writing a book on this at some point because it's not, it's not just starting a franchise, you know, that, that represents a massive financial investment and a lot of challenges in and of itself. Like if I were to go start a, whatever, a gym franchise or whatever, that would be hard in and of itself. The challenge was with Osteo Strong was 
that it is a new concept. It's a new industry. There wasn't biohacking wasn't even a term when I started in 2012. No one, no one thought about that kind of thing. So I, I opened up a couple of prototype centers just to see, you know, well, how's the market going to, going to respond to this. So I just went and got an LLC and rented a spot, bought some equipment, talked to a graphic artist and, you know, make me a, make me a, a logo. And I just opened it to see what we can do and what the sales would look like and what the interest was out there. Um, and I, th there was, there's a big need for what is it we're doing and, uh, and, and doing membership. It's a membership model and the sales and all that stuff I got. And I thought the, the biggest challenge was going to be, you know, how do you educate the consumer on what is that we do? Um, and that in the beginning was the biggest challenge. You know, remember, you know, Facebook didn't have Facebook ads. There was no click funnels, nothing like that when I started. So it was, it was a lot of belly to belly and just, you know, guerrilla kind of marketing just to get the word out there and a lot of presentations and that kind of thing. So yeah, uh, we just went out there and started a prototype and I'm like, okay, I get this. I can do this. This is going to be a, it's going to be a battle to like get this brand out there, but I wasn't looking forward to being a trailblazer because the trailblazer, trailblazer takes the arrows and the bullets and all that kind of stuff. You want to be the guy that's standing behind the trailblazer usually, but it's a blue ocean industry. No one's doing it. And the best place to be is number one in a blue ocean industry, because now you get to write all the rules, you get to create everything. So that, that for me was really scratch the itch of who I am. Um, People could say you're, if you're an entrepreneur, you're either enlightened or damaged, uh, and you could argue both. <laughs> yeah, what was it? So once you once you started uh, the first Osteo Strong and you you were out there testing it, what was it you were looking for, or at what point were you like, okay, this could be bigger? I was looking for market acceptance first. I wanted to make sure that this is something that people would just be willing to pay for, right? Uh, and that was the, one of the big challenges. Like I just didn't know, and so. Um, once I saw that consumers were getting results and they're willing to pay for it and that there was a need in the marketplace, then, I, then that, that was all I needed. I, I'm the, I'm the type of person to have a vision first. This is what I want. Um, I never know the how of how I'm going to do things. But once I saw there was a need that we could satisfy and that people are willing to spend money on it, then I'm like, okay, that's all I need. I'm going. Um, and that's when I started meeting with the franchise attorneys and all that kind of thing to get it, get it rolling. Describe what it would have been like to walk into an Osteo Strong, uh, one of the first Osteo Strongs. There's not, um, there's not a whole lot of difference. I mean, you would recognize it as an Osteo Strong. Uh, the difference really was in, you know, we didn't know anything about like what we were going to do about the con consumer experience or the education or the sales process. There was a lot I didn't know about, um, about how the customer experience was going to have to evolve and come and turn into it's one of the challenge with the Osteo Strong is you're, you're only there for 10 or 15 minutes once a week. And so how do you create value around all this kind of stuff? So if you were to walk into one, you, you'd be like, okay, yeah, the brand's older, the earlier version, but there's a lot of similarities uh, to what you'll see in Osteo Strong today. What you wouldn't see was that we didn't have the messaging, the, you know, really the, the consumer education or the consumer experience and that would have been something you wouldn't have seen, but you would have uh, you would have sensed that uh, within within a very short period of time because we didn't know what we were doing. At what point did you begin to evolve that experience? Uh, the, the evolution's been constant. Um, so you know, um, you, you, I bootstrapped the whole business, which means you know I funded the whole thing. And so in the beginning, you're like, okay, I've got this chunk of cash that I'm willing to go ahead and and launch this and make it happen. And then I've got, on the other hand, you, you don't want to just consume all your money. So you've got to, you got to grow the brand, make the money and innovate as you go. Um, and, and so the, the, the desire was to get locations open so that we can continue our learning. I knew the demand was there. I knew consumers would pay for it, but I did not know everything that we were going to have to be or become to create confidence and validation of the brand. So um, the things that, you know, the, I guess, education, sales, and marketing were the, the, the biggest things on our forefront of our mind. And then as we matured and I matured more into the brand, then it became, okay, we've really got to master the consumer experience because it's such an abbreviated experience. You got to make sure that you're creating value to justify the expense of people coming in there. So it was kind of that order. It was marketing, sales, education, 
customer experience was kind of the track that we went down. You know, I've been in Osteo Strong. It's, it is an experience. As soon as you walk in, it's, uh, it's unlike anything else. What effect have you seen on the business as you've sort of uh, expanded and improved that? Um, there's so many things that contribute to the consumer acceptance, acceptance and experience that you, you can't really put your finger on any one thing. Um, when you're deal, dealing with something that's unknown, that's new. So there's, there's a book you may have heard of. It's called Crossing the Chasm. And in the book, I think, I don't remember when it was original copyright, but there's been two or three versions of it. I think it came out in 90s originally, and then there's been two or three versions of it. I recommend it if you're wanting to go to market with something new. But essentially, the concept is there's a bell curve of consumers out there, and any new product or service is going to to attract the early adopters. But that is the smallest chunk of your potential marketplace. The other chunk of the marketplace is much bigger. It's, you know, 50 times more consumers out there. But these people are waiting on validation and confidence from the from the from the first group. I'm not an early adopter. That's not the kind of consumer I am. I'm always I always look for, you know, I don't go see a movie until three people told me they liked the movie because I don't want to waste my time. I don't, I wasn't the first guy to go buy an iPhone yet. I owned a technology company. I was like the last guy to buy one um, because I just want to make sure I'm not wasting my time. So I'm probably the least attractive guy for people wanting to bring a new product to market. And there are a lot of people out there like that and they have different motivations to reason why they do it. So when I looked at this, the challenge of the brand was to create broad-based consumer acceptance of what is that we were doing. And so um, I, I started looking, how do I do this? How do I differentiate myself? I need Dr. Jaquish on my team. We need to develop a better st- a technology stack. I need Tony Robbins in my corner. It's kind of funny. That was actually a goal of mine. And, um, and so I had to build all these things to make it happen. We needed better science. We needed a better brand. We needed, so each one of these things, a better consumer experience, I had to develop my teams and all this stuff. And so it was a long-term expensive strategic plan to, to, to find that consumer acceptance at a level we needed to grow it at these various levels that we've gone through. Um, each one has had its own contribution and incremental steps. As I see, like, you know, franchise, it opens up, opened up in the past 12 months, does so much better, faster now than franchises that were opened up in the first year, second year, third year, fourth year. And it, so people say, well, why is that? I'm like, because it, it was an accumulating effect of everything that we've been focusing on from, you know, from consumer experience to education, to improving our talk track, to getting Tony to me speak on stage with that. And it's just been so many things. I can't really say that it was any one thing. Um, and I'm, and, and I'm not the, I'm not the only guy with all the ideas, you know, I'm, I'm always looking to see what somebody else is doing and, and, uh, and, and one of my franchisees or I'm taking advice from somebody else and you have to sift through all this because probably 95% of the advice you get is bad um, or just not right timing for the brand. And so you've got to sift through it and just be, don't let your own ego stand in the way and just like, okay, is this really a bad idea or is it just me having an ego about my brand and being honest with yourself as you ask yourself those questions and then incrementally changing as you need. So I think it's one of the really cool things about being a franchisor or a franchisee is the accelerated learning of having multiple locations open and um and you just have this family of people that are coming together and can all we're all focusing on expanding the brand both at their local market but globally as well you talked about you know some things that uh, benefit both the franchisee and the franchisor and you've been on both sides of that that fence you know you came from owning multiple curves locations. Now you're running the franchise uh, business. Uh, what experience as a franchisee have you sort of drawn on and, and how has that helped you, you think? So I think um, when Curves got started, it's kind of funny. We were like franchise number 87 for Curves and they ended up opening like 15,000 locations or something like that. In the beginning, I think one of the biggest challenges for, for a franchisor and that what I saw is they were growing fast too. And of course, this was back in the 90s. So, you know, you didn't have like the technology support that we have now. So their biggest challenge was communicating, managing their culture uh, with their franchisees. And they were they were kind of like us, just opening up franchisees everywhere. And they would sometimes open up a franchise location. And then that franchisee would just never hear from the franchisor again. 
and no, no, uh, you know, no, no criticism of, of them and what they were doing. They were doing the best they could with what the resources they had and the technology at the time. One of the things that I wanted to avoid is I wanted to make sure the best I could that the franchisees all felt connected and were getting communicated with as frequently as possible. And I won't say that I've been successful that 100% of the time, but uh, a lot better than I thought we would do uh, in making sure that everybody is feels like they're part of the family and being communicated with. So communication with the franchisee is a big deal. Everybody wants to be involved in the innovation and growth of the brand. Uh, so when I was a franchisee, you know, you've know, you got all these ideas and you want, you want corporate to implement your ideas where I think that I was immature when I was in my 20s and early 30s doing the curves thing is I would have all these great ideas and I would get frustrated that the, the corporate wouldn't implement my awesome ideas, right? Why aren't they doing my ideas are so freaking awesome, right? And I think that that's, you know, now that I'm on that side and I'm a franchisor, I have a lot more respect and understanding of what they were going through at the time and a lot more understanding. And I and having been a franchisee, I have a lot of respect and understanding for what it is that they want and how they want to contribute to the brand. And so I have to... I. I have to balance with, okay, the stuff we can do, the projects we can implement, and being able to listen and say no to people in a way that is, leaves them on higher ground. Um, because I don't want people to feel like a lot of the franchisees felt with curves in those days where they weren't being listened to, their ideas weren't being implemented. We implement as many as we can, but it's always got to be balanced with timing. Is this right for the brand? Even though it could be a good idea, it just may not be the best time for the brand or the brand might, might not be able to handle it. So I guess uh, I had a lot of respect for curves and their training systems. Uh, they were, they were absolutely militant um, on training very, very specific tactical things on their brand. Other competitors would come along in the beginning days of curves with better equipment, better looking facilities, and they all disappear. And it's never about, it's really, it's never really about your actual product or service. It's more about your brand, your culture, and your customer experience. I just got off a call with a bunch of prospect and franchisees um, before this, and somebody was asking, you know, what if you're going to have competitors someday, or would somebody develop something better? And I said, you know, somebody will, and God bless them if they do. And I said, there's 35,000 gyms in the United States right now competing for about 12% of the, uh, for the population uh, to be a member. And I was like going, and they make lots of money. I said, we could, we could have 20 competitors and be just fine. I'm not worried about that. What I really focus on is our, is our brand, our customer experience, our innovation, our processes, our systems. I mean, the, the company that has sold more hamburgers in the world than anybody is McDonald's. Um, but nobody could argue that they got the best hamburgers in the world. They are a master of branding and processes and systems. And that is the, that is the key. Uh, and that's, you know, from communication to the franchisees to listening and, and growing and developing teams to where the, where the, where I see the brand going, I'm fanatically focused on processes, innovation, operations, branding, this kind of thing, because if, if you're not, you're, you're just selling a product that anybody else can come along and, and replace you. Yeah, this topic always happens to come up in these podcasts, the idea of building a community and having a community for your members or your customers to feel like they belong to. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned your particular model, you know, they're only there for 10 minutes, right? Yet somehow you have to maintain the retention of those members and and give them a reason to stick around. And you just said, you know, it's not always the uh, the products or the technology, so it's that experience, right? Yeah, the, uh, you know, Tony taught me this um, and my, my relationship with Tony and what I've learned from him opened up a, a, such a massive universe for me. And I'll admit when I met Tony and he invited me to his first event, and I'll, I'll admit it, I was, I was kind of arrogant. I didn't think, you know, I was like, you know, look, I, at the time I'm married, I had three kids, brand businesses, you know, you know, what am I going to learn? This is for everybody else, how wrong I was. And so what I've learned from him in this regard is, is just my universe is a hundred times bigger. I think much bigger and I, um, than I used to, and I see things a lot differently. Um, as, it re- as it relates to the consumer experience, you know, one of the first thing Tony teaches you when you go to his kind of beginner event, which is Unleash the Power Within, which if you're going to go to a Tony event, you got to go to that one first because you're going to learn so much foundational stuff. 
he talks about the six human needs and everybody has the exact same human needs. We don't have seven and you don't have five, you've got six. And you satisfy those human needs differently. Everybody's got to, you know, some people speed their need for significance in a different way than I would, but you still have the need for significance. And then six human needs are certainty, uncertainty, significance, love, uh, growth, and contribution. And one of the things after I kind of learned that I was at Business Mastery and he was talking about how do you create a raving fan culture and it's a big deal about, you know, uh, I won't get into all that. It's obvious why you want a raving fan culture. But one of the things he was talking about consumers is that, and just human nature in general, he goes, if a person can satisfy three human needs doing anything, whether it's a bad habit, a good habit, a company they want to do business with, whatever, if you satisfy three human needs in that experience, he says, you create an addiction. And that was a real eye-opening thing for me because it, and it really it really helped solidify a lot of the things that I knew. I'm like, oh, that's why I do this thing. That's why I do that because um, it's not about your product or service. Yes, your product or service has to do something. You can't sell air, right? Um, but beyond that, you've got to create a cons customer experience where it's, you're satisfying at least three human needs every time you interact with a customer so that you create a raving fan. They've got an emotional connection with you. Human beings don't do anything without uh, satisfying one of those needs. And you could talk to the most staunch, hard-ass engineer in the world. He's still making his decisions emotionally first. It's just that the, the time between his emotional uh, driver and his logical mind is so close, it's imperceptible. When it's always emotion first, everybody's that way. And I was like, dang, we got to be better at this. And so Tony was really the impetus for us uh, taking our customer experience to another level, getting really tactical on that, caring, love, falling more in love with your customer than we do with our, with our product. If you fall more in love with your product or service than you do with your consumer, then you're not, you, you inhibit your ability to innovate because you have to be able to look at what is you do and just say, you know what, that's old and we got to be better. So if we've got to go change something, do something, if you care more about the consumer and you're more interested in serving their needs, then you don't care so much about your, your widget or your whatever, your magic bullet or whatever it is that you sell. It's uh, you don't worry about that. That's what you innovated. Now you go love the customer, serve their needs. And if their needs are, changing then you've got to switch out your product you know you got to be and, and that's a hard thing to do emotionally especially when you've got so much heart and soul and what is it you're developing to be able to let go of that and just go oh okay my product is cool serving a need now but it may not later on and i've got to be able to recognize that and so sir, mastering serving human needs was is absolutely key uh to creating a raving fan culture that's great so you guys, you guys have seen some growth uh, recently in the last few years. Talk about what kind of growth you've seen. How many units are you, do you have in the U.S. and where are y'all internationally? So, yeah, we should have, I think we got about 96 units total. We should have over 100 open by the end of July, uh, which is kind of a big deal, the 100 mark. I'm happy about that. In the United States, I mean, internationally, we probably have a dozen units right now of those, but we've launched in like nine countries in the past 14 uh, months. So we've launched in Spain, Sweden, Denmark, England, Greece, and Australia. We're about to launch in Poland, Bulgaria, uh, Norway. Um, and then we've got four or five other countries that we're in negotiations with right now. Um, and that, that was so freaking hard uh, to do because you've got language, customs, cultures, legal considerations, communications, time zones, logistics, all that stuff while you're trying to grow the brand and do all the awesome stuff you do domestically. I mean, it really, really pushed our team to the, to the limits and, you know, God bless them. They, they all stepped up and, and they've done a, a great job. I love the people that I work with, but yeah, the, the growth has been great. We've done all that. I don't know if there's a franchise in the history of the world that's ever, expand into that many countries that fast. I'm not saying that to impress you or anybody else. I'm just saying that, you know, it's the, the demand for what it is that we do is there. The excitement for the brand is real. And people always ask me, hey, what country are you looking at to go into next? You know, how'd you decide on this country or that country? It's like, I never, I never think about what country I want to go to. What I'm really looking for is the right partner in that country. If I find the right people 
that's like it's like you know people are like you're going into freaking Bulgaria. I'm like I, I had to go look at the map. I'm like where exactly is Bulgaria? Uh, I kind of knew it was over there in uh, you know Serbia or something. I had to go what to, to Bulgaria and then now the the guy him and his wife were the right people. Um, they had the passion for the brand. They had the resources. They wanted to bring it to their country. We always make the prospect put together their own business plan and tell us what they're going to do, how they're going to expand the brand because they've got to have the vision for it. I don't want to be the one that tells them, here's your vision. Can you do it? I want to hear what's your vision. You know what we do. You see what we're doing. You tell us what you can do. And so that's how we select the countries. The people come to us and then that, those are the countries we go into. Um, here domestically, and I think, you know, we're opening up about a location a week now. We think we'll be two to four a week by the end of this year. And uh, I think there's a chance, I'm not sure we're going to do it because we had, we, we were, we had, we lost about a month, month and a half of franchise sales in the United States for legal filing laws for 2019 franchise agreement. But I think there's a chance we might end up in the top 10 fastest growing franchises, uh, this year. Um, and then there's a, there's a chance we might hit number one in 2020. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask you about the challenges of, of, uh, being a franchise or versus a franchisee, but we've, I feel like we've almost covered it naturally in our conversation. You're talking about expanding internationally and translations and, uh, various it's expensive to start a franchise, uh, franchise or to be a franchise for, I mean, it, you know, if you're going to start become a franchise or bring both checkbooks, the, the challenging, the, one of the reasons why I didn't want to start a franchise was the, um, not only is it expensive to do, there's just a lot of law around franchising and every state is different. Um, it's, it's risky uh, to be a franchisor. People like suing franchisors. And I think one of the things like, and you might be able to think about this in your own life, you know, maybe, maybe not so much today, you're pretty mature uh, guy doing some cool stuff. But, uh, you know, when I was younger, I look back and you look at challenges you have in your life where you have something where you fail at. And when a human being fails at something, they're generally going to grow from it and look at what they learn, which is the very mature way to think about failure, or they're going to look, they're going to go on a witch hunt and look for people to blame for their failure. And uh, when you've got a franchisee that's not successful, you, you know, you've got to become really concerned about that because you don't know what kind of person they're ultimately going to be. Are they going to start, are they going to go on a witch hunt and come after you? Or are, you know, are they going to grow from it? Uh, and so that's the thing you always worry about with franchising and the laws in certain states are so much in favor of the franchisees, you know, like, dang, I don't want to go into lawsuits. These people, I want to treat them like family, right? I want to grow the brand together. So you got to be careful about that when starting franchises that it, it, it does take a lot of money. If I would have, if I would have thought we would have only been able to open up one or 200 osteostrongs, I would have never started. It. You know, there's just not enough money in one or 200 locations to justify the expense and the risk. Um, but I sensed that it was going to be a global brand with 10,000 plus locations around the world. I knew the demand was there. We knew we were creating a blue ocean. The market was real. The need was real. Um, the, the, the results were ridiculously real. And so I thought, you know what, this is a risk I'm willing to take. And I, if, and I think if I was 15 years older, I wouldn't have started it. That, uh, when I started, of course, I'm 50 years old now. So I started when I was, you know, like 41, 42. So I'm like, man, I got a lot of life left on this stick. I'm going to go ahead and, and, uh, and swing this bat and make it happen. So what have you used? What are, what have been some tools you guys have implemented to just help you grow? You know, it's uh, the, you know, the social media marketing is really great. Um, I'm, it's, it's a really fantastic tool because you get to so target specific market segments. And so like we serve several different market segments. We've got elderly people who are concerned about osteoporosis. We've got kind of middle-aged people that are more lifestyle. They don't have time like people like me have time to do anything. And then you've got your athletes and biohackers that are really wanting to just get ridiculous performance goals. I can create messaging for each one of those and I can target it specifically uh, through social media and I don't have to worry about cross-message uh, cross confusion across multiple market segments. And I think that's an amazing gift. And so when I look at the different tools, there's so many tools we use and you take them for granted, um, but we, uh, social media marketing has been phenomenal. Um, it's really amazing. You got to master that. Um, you know, a lot of software technologies we use to create visibility and dashboards and what we're doing. I guess Trello paid a, played a big role in what it is that we do. Um, but there's a, 
there's just a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of the technology tools, and I think most people care about when they're thinking about this is how am I going to get consumers? And then I would say, you know, social media marketing is so powerful. You almost can't afford to spend money on anything else because like if you do TV or radio or whatever, it's just a sawed off shotgun. You'd have no idea what your ROI is. You're always just going to be kind of guessing, right? With social media marketing, you know, down to the freaking penny what you're spending and what's working and you can turn on a dime. It's beautiful. I mean, that's about it. And then with Austin Strong, we actually have a complete distributed workforce. Everybody who works for me works all over the round, around the world now. Um, and we don't actually have a, the closest thing we have to central office locations, our training uh, team, they're in uh, Albuquerque. They all live there and they're amazing people. So we'll always be in Albuquerque, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's the way the technology is right now. We all work from home. We don't have an office building or anything like that, but we've, you know, we're up about a hundred franchises running in nine countries. So it's amazing. You know, six, uh, 10 years ago, you just couldn't do that. And then you guys have a pretty strong presence at, at a lot of Tony events as well, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, he let me, st- we, we, uh, he became my partner like day one of 2017. I mean, I remember it was right after Christmas, 2016. We were, the guy doesn't take time off. I mean, he's, you know, we have meetings sometimes at 12, one o'clock in the morning. I want to be in bed. He's ready to have a meeting. So we're like meeting, you know, two or three days before the end of the year and talking to attorneys and stuff. And finally we get our agreement done and signed it. It was like January one or something like that. Uh, four months later, I'm on, uh, I asked him, I said, can I go on stage, uh, speak at this event? It was kind of funny the way that it came together because I wasn't supposed to. We were opening up the first location in southern Spain uh, for my international director of sales and development. And then a week later, I was going to be on stage. Well, I wasn't going to be. We were opening there and I was gonna, we were going to go there and have a booth. And then his production manager called me because they have a different production team that they contract with outside the United States and called me up and said, uh, sorry, you, you can't have a booth there. We just know space for you. I was like, oh man. So I just called Tony and left him a message. Say, hey, I don't, I'm not going to have a booth space there. And I said, you know, I've got two asks. One, since I'm going to be there anyway, could I have a ticket? And two, um, what do you say about me speaking on stage? And so he calls me back and he's like, yeah, I guess so. We'll give you 10 minutes on Sunday. Have you ever spoke on stage before? And so I had like two weeks to prepare uh, and I just, I'd actually got injured in playing a game called Turkish Delight. Some guy tackled me, wasn't supposed to, and I tore cartilage in my front and back rib, one of my ribs, and I damaged my right shoulder somehow. A guy took me out. I thought I broke my back. An North Peak surgeon actually ran at me. He thought I broke something in likely my back. And I didn't, thank God I had strong bones. But I couldn't sleep on my left side. I couldn't sleep on my right side. Every breath I took hurt, and I got sick, and so I'm coughing. I'm jet lagged, and I got to go and speak in front of 8,000 people. So I speak on stage now at all of his events. I guess they, I guess I did good because they had me come back and they still let me speak on stage. Um, but now I speak on, at that event all around the world. And, uh, and I'm very, very grateful for it because it's been a great way to get the, the messaging out. What's interesting though is I, I think for me, a real sign of like, okay, are we turned the corner because is it just people who are buying franchises that are Tony Robbins people? And when do we, when do we turn that corner? And it's funny this year when I do like calls like this that we're on, I'll talk to prospect to franchisees and I'll do group meetings. Um, most of the people in the meetings this year have not come from Tony events, which surprises me. They're like, Oh, we heard about it from this, or I knew somebody from that or blah, blah, blah. And most people aren't coming from Tony events anymore, which is pretty wild. Let's talk about the vision for the future of Osteo Strong. Where do you see this going? And what do you see as the future of, of health and wellness? Uh, two different questions, two big questions. I'll t- I will answer the question this thing with a little bit of philosophical perspective that I think is uh, that I've I had a, a martial arts instructor tell me when I was like 17 years old, never forgot it. And it's applied to so many things. He said, you know, life is like a mountain and he wasn't an Asian guy, but it seems like a very Yoda-esque, you know, sort of Mr. Miyagi thing to say. But he says, you know, life is kind of like a mountain. He says, when you're at the bottom of the mountain, it's safe. He says, not a long distance to fall. You can run around, you can play, you can be a goofball. And he says, but the view sucks. And he says, the further you go up the mountain, your view changes and your perspective changes, but there, you, the mountain's getting smaller and smaller as you go up it. And he goes, and there's a lot less air, less, less uh, room to screw around and make mistakes. And if you do, the fall is a lot greater. So the way that I see the brand is what I see today is not what I saw in the beginning. It was, it was kind of an idea as a vision. It was like, I'm, I think I could do this, but I don't really know what it's going to be. I didn't really know how it's going to evolve. Right now, what I see Osteo Strong is, Osteo Strong is going to be the fastest growing franchise in the world. 
Um, it's going to be a multi-billion dollar corporation. Uh, it'll be a household name. It will be, uh, we'll partner with governments uh, in their healthcare systems to deal with things like osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes. And our goal is to be one of the top 10 most innovative wellness brands in the world. There's no freaking way I would have thought all of that two years ago. Um, I absolutely believe to me in my core that that is the trajectory we're on. The, um, the people that we're partnering with, the conversations we're having, the companies we're talking to, I would have never in this lifetime, I would have attracted that kind of attention. Um, so, you know, will it be the same vision two years from now? I don't know. Uh, but it, the vision's only gotten bigger and the universe has only gotten bigger as we've grown, which you never know how big your company's going to get. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of runway between now and that vision. There's a lot of challenges and things that I'm sure that I'll deal with that I haven't even considered yet. But I think that is the trajectory and the potential for the brand. And uh, we are definitely uh, going in that direction. So I, I think in terms of like you asked, where's fitness going today? There is such a, a paradigm shift happening in fitness now where, you know, I'm in the best physical shape of my life at 50 years old. I work out less and everything I do is so much more efficient now because you know, my time is the most valuable thing in my day. And so I think people are looking about that's what the, the essence of biohacking is. How do I get what I want with the least amount of effort time that's most efficient? I'm not hurting my body, not creating inflammation. And I think the gym industry has a challenge because uh, exercise causes inflammation. Too much of it is not good for you. Your body needs rest. I mean, I'm in ketosis now. I'm on, I'm on a uh, wrapping up a 48 hour fast tonight. So I've been fasting for uh, 45 hours or 43 hours or something like that. And your body needs time to repair and do the things that it does. And you need to, you need to be very intentional about what you make yourself do for maximum health because it could hurt you. And I think the, ultimately a lot of the things that people do in fitness and I'm, and I believe in fitness, I believe in being healthy, but I don't believe that traditional fitness is really the most healthy thing for you. And so they're much more efficient ways. So what is the future of fitness? I think, I think the mindset of the consumer is shifting in that they are looking for efficiency, maximum results, minimal effort. Um, and I think that's why OsteoStrong is gonna be this multi-billion dollar brand because I think that is the most efficient way to achieve that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was sitting down with Dave Asprey and Tony and Asprey, who's the father of the term biohacking, right? And he, and one of the things he said about osteostrong, he says it is the ultimate, it is the ultimate biohack. He goes like, if you were going to create, like try to find one modality that defines biohacking, it would be osteostrong because nothing I've ever seen creates such a dramatic change and a dramatic result with such an abbreviated effort. Um, and you know, we're with, with that. And I, I knew that it was cool hearing Dave say that, but, um, with, with that, uh, statement, and where the industry is going, and the fact that we're first to market with unique technology that's been patented in over 60 countries, I mean, it's mine to lose at this point. And so I think that I think society is going through a massive upheaval now in fitness, and I'm really curious to see how gyms pivot uh, to deal with uh, what's coming. That's awesome. Well, Kyle, is there any advice that you would give an aspiring, uh, either somebody who wants to, to start a franchise or Maybe it's not a franchise. Maybe it's a multi-unit uh, business that they own all, all um, together. So um, I think that it's, it's, like the, it's like the advice I give to people who are thinking about having kids. I did, like a, I did a, a little live video on Father's Day about this. And what I tell people is, I look, kids are expensive. They're a time suck. You become a servant in your own life. But here's the thing. If you look at having kids that way, you'll never have them. Because what I say is, the quintessential human experience can only be achieved by having kids. Uh, you will never know your capacity to love. You will never know your capacity to feel emotional pain. You'll never know you. There's so many things you don't even never know about yourself until you have these freaking human beings. Um, entrepreneurship is kind of like that. There are so many things you don't know about yourself. So many opportunities to learn, so many opportunities to grow that you never get by not, being an entrepreneur and starting a business and dealing with all those challenges is never about whether or not you fail. It's never about how much money you spend. It is the freaking journey and the wisdom and the information that you get makes life so much more 
interesting and fun and it's awesome. So my advice is freaking do it. Um, don't screw around. Your life is you, there's only so many businesses you can start. Like Tony talks about this during business mastery he says it takes like seven or eight years to get a business from concept to badass. And you only have so many seven or eight year chunks in your life, you know, that you actually have the energy, the time, the money to do that kind of thing. So you have to do it. It's a have to. Um, if it scares you, you must. And it's only fear holding you back from everything. The other advice I would give to people is uh, don't worry about failure. Don't worry about outcomes. It's don't worry about the how. You are going to fail. You are going to screw up. There's going to be shit that you don't know how to do. I've never known what the hell I was doing when I started a business. I never knew. I always started shit that I had no experience in. Um, the how just kind of works itself out, you know. Um, Figuring shit out back in the 90s before the internet, that was freaking hard. Now, I mean, I could freaking remove somebody's appendix after watching a 15-minute YouTube video. I give people advice all the time. I don't charge for my advice. I probably should, but I don't want to start another business. Um, so, you know, I think if somebody knows me or whatever, they're friends with me on Facebook, they want to chat and I got, you know, an hour, I'll help. Uh, I do that. I just started a company and she's selling organic bamboo straws. And so she, she and I spent an hour on the phone yesterday and I'm giving advice on organic bamboo straw company. Have I ever started one of those? No, but the principles are often the same. It, uh, starting a franchise is incredibly expensive. There's a lot of, there are a lot of challenges. If you think you're going to start this franchise and you think 50 or hundred locations is going to be worth it, don't. Uh, it's too, it's too expensive, too risky to do it. If you think it's a 500 or thousand location opportunity, then, then that's something you should take a look at, but don't get involved with that until you have the money and the concept. That's my advice on that. And if you, if you have questions or whatever for me on Facebook, send me a message and I'll, I'll get back to you eventually. <laughs> Help you awesome. out with that analysis. And I, it's my pleasure to do it. I have got, I'm a sucker for entrepreneurs. I absolutely love the journey and anybody willing to face face that dragon and take it on and grow through it. Freaking awesome. Awesome human being. You got mass respect for me right from day one, regardless of whether or not, whether you are, if you're just starting or you've been doing it for 10 or 20 years, I have a lot of respect for people that are willing to face their fears and go do it. It's awesome. Well, Kyle, I appreciate you coming on taking the time. Uh, where can everybody go to learn more about Osteo Strong? Yeah, sure. It's uh, osteostrong.me. Uh, is the website. We've got a lot of cool resources and stuff up there. And of course, there's, uh, there's Osteo Strong locations popping up all over the place. And, uh, and uh, you know, go, go hop on their Facebook pages or just jump, go into them. Most Osteo Strong owners will let you try a free, se free session just to go see what it's about. I'll tell you one quick story. Um, one of the number one triathletes in the world, female, uh, Rebecca Keat, um, her and her partner own the, now the number one triathlete training center in the world in in Boulder, Colorado. She did, Rebecca just retired like a year, year and a half ago. And I met her at a Tony Robbins event. And I was talking about Osteo Strong and she was intrigued, right? She's looking at me and she's like, you're not a super athlete. You know, why should I listen to you? And I said, you know, look, you know everything about health and fitness. I can't tell you anything. I just know one thing you don't. So she finally got around to going down to our training center because we didn't have any centers at the time in, in Colorado. She did one session. She called me up the next week and she says, what the F? And I said, what, what, what happened? She's like, I just did 40% more dumbbell flies than I've ever done in my life. She did one session. And now they, now we have an Osteo Strong in Boulder and they take all their triathletes through Osteo Strong sessions. So it's uh, go, go try a session. It'll, it'll change your life there. If there's any one thing you can do to maximize your, your musculoskeletal system, it is this, nothing works better. I encourage you to try to it. change your life. And if you, if you have joint and back pain like me, freaking go now. You'll, you'll be happy you did. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks, Kyle. I appreciate you, Jared. Have a good one.